Hello, everybody, and welcome to the UN Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment. This is the third global session. My name is Charles Ross, and I am the Director of the Economist Intelligence Unit, Public Policy and Thought Leadership Division here in Asia. And I am based in Singapore, so it's a good evening from me from Singapore. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody who has joined us from around the world. It's a real pleasure to be spending some time with you today to have a good discussion around marine litter and microplastics mitigation and prevention. Later today, there'll be a session on rethinking cities to be more sustainable. And tomorrow, my colleague at the EIU, Pratima Singh, will lead a discussion on nature positive food systems on Saturday, with the global session ending later on Saturday with a session looking at how different sectors can work together to harness new technologies and scientific advances to solve global issues affecting our planet. So we're gonna end on a, on a really big note tomorrow afternoon. But before I get into the detail, a few housekeeping notes for you all. The session is being recorded, so it will be available online after the event. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions throughout the session, so please do use the question function on the platform that you are using, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we possibly can throughout the session. I'll introduce each speaker, but full bios are available on the site, so I won't go into all that detail because we do have 12 excellent speakers who are going to be uh, presenting and speaking to you today. Um, and they're drawn from the government, private sector and international organizations, all providing their own unique perspective on the topic. But we only have a limited 90 minutes, so I'll be doing my best to keep everybody to, to five minute sections for each of their interventions. Through the course of this session, we'll examine three key questions with the aim of generating actionable insights and policy recommendations by the end of this session. So those three questions are, what does this latest science tell us about the risks posed by marine litter and microplastics for ecosystems, human health and society? Two, in order to manage and mitigate the risk of marine litter in our environment, what urgent policy action is required at the multilateral and national levels? And what part does innovation, technology and finance have to play? What does multi-stakeholder cooperation offer in the management and mitigation of marine litter and microplastics related risks? So three big questions and not too much time. So we're gonna get straight into it. And so the reason we're talking about this today is that the ocean is drowning in plastic. Pew Research estimates at 11 million metric tons into the seas each year. And so without concerted effort, even dramatic action, this could reach 29 million metric tons a year within the next two decades. And although awareness of the challenge by policymakers, business leaders, non-government organizations, and the public has improved due to concerted efforts, including, I must say, a lot of work that we're doing big, through big initiatives at The Economist, including one which is launching next month. Still, much more needs to be done. But before we get to the discussion, I've got great pleasure in inviting Letizia Cavallo, who's the head of Marine and Freshwater Branch of UNEP, to introduce the session and give us her view on the challenges and opportunities which we face. Letizia, welcome. Thank you very much. All right, Charles, and I'm speaking from Nairobi. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. And my pleasure to be here. So I had of the 50 United Nations Environment Assembly, UNEA, next week, and part of the UN Science Policy Business Forum, I really welcome you to this event that is co-convened with the Global Partnership on Marine Litter. This event will address marine litter and microplastic in the context of risk management and mitigation and prevention efforts, as Charles, Charles just mentioned. This event is one of a several on the ocean agenda, such as the high level session two days ago on ocean action for sustainability, building a global vision to tackle plastic pollution. This was hosted, that was hosted by UNAP and the Kenyan government, which recognized the magnitude and urgency of addressing marine litter and its impact on life below and as well above water. 
And on Wednesday, colleagues, it was really a pleasure to see many member states as Portugal, Tanzania, US, and UK join hands and voices uh, with Kenya and UNAP on this subject. Looking forward, another very interesting event will take place on 25th February on understanding the state of the ocean, a global manual on measuring for the SDG 1411.1. SDG 1414, SDG 1.1, apologies, SDG 14 2.1 and SDG 14 5.1 and the GPML digital platform phase one that we will present there. So uh, in this journey to set the scene for the debates uh, and discussions of today, I would like to uh, put and start to face uh, a couple of questions. First is why it is so important to address this issue. Marine litter, as you mentioned, Charles, uh, is wreaking havoc on the world's oceans and other ecosystems. By 2050, the planet will need to provide food, jobs, energy, raw materials to sustain the population, to sustain the population of 10 billion people. But this hangs in the balance due to the triple planetary crisis, the climate, nature, and pollution crisis. Our oceans are at the nexus of all of these three major crisis our humanity is facing. 59% of the global ocean is experiencing significantly increasing cumulative human impacts, in particular to the climate change, but also from expanding fishing, uh, land sources of uh, pollution and shipping. Driven by decades of unsustainable consumption and production, 2020 was a year that raised awareness of the interlinkages between our own health and that of our planet. The long-term ability of our oceans to provide services essential to human well-being relies on policies and economic models that promote sustainability, enhance sector efficiency, and minimize environmental impacts from human activities and consumption. Marine ecosystem services comprise more than 60% of the economic value of all life on Earth. And with one in 10 people relying on marine fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. So my second point is the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the surge in single plastic use, but it is also presents an opportunity for us to look at how we can build back better. During the current global COVID pandemic, plastic consumption, consumption has drastically increased. For one, the single-use face mask prediction soared all over the world, but also as people are locked down, the packaging market size is projected to grow, mainly due to the pandemic response. Furthermore, miscommunication on the safety of plastics in the context of this healthy crisis led, has led to the rollback of progress achieved in promoting policies and practices aimed at reducing plastic pollution. So it's really vital to take action for a healthy planet, and this is exactly what we will debate today. My third point, briefly, is to take time. It's, it's time to act now. And looking ahead, there are major initiatives which we can coordinate in ambitious action between all stakeholders to address the planetary crisis that oceans faces. As today, the discussions will uh, be most stakeholder driven in complementation of what happened on Wednesday. We will count on the honorable participation of the chair of the ad hoc expert group in marine litter and microplastics, uh, Mr. Saturo Ino the, from the Minister of Environment of Japan that will also uh, reflect on that process with us today. And as uh, UNEA part one is next week, uh, the international community has took this opportunity and this debate today, uh, a great and excellent chance to build a momentum that can uh, drive ambitious, bold and start to take action at the international level. So the combination is really interesting. And to conclude, um, we all have to uh, act at this moment. And uh, a risk approach can really inform and help the international community to prioritize actions. So in this regard, UNAP publication from Pollution to Solution, a global marine litter and microplastic assessment was conducted, highlighting new developments and building and reinforcing what was already uh, described in 2016, 
with the previous assessment on marine plastic debris and microplastics. I'd like uh, really to say how proud we are to have during the event today uh, and hear from our uh, lead author, Professor Jack McGlade, who will present some of these key findings uh, for us uh, over this debate. So I would like really for that uh, Charles uh, say how much I wish, uh, I wish all of you a very uh, nice and great debate today. Back to you, Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Letizia, um, and thank you for your for your kind words. Um, you mentioned um, Jackie, and I'm, so I'm going to move straight on to her. In the interest of time, you've told us a lot of things that we needed to achieve, and we there is haste is of the of the essence here. So let's start on that by getting a better understanding of the risks we face in achieving these these lofty goals that Letizia has outlined. And so I'd like to introduce Professor Jacqueline McLeod. She's the lead author of UNEP's Global Assessment on Marine Litter and Microplastics. Welcome, Jackie. I understand you have some slides to share with us as well. I do. Thank you very much, Charles, for that handover. Um, yes, if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, so as a backdrop, we have been working on this assessment for a couple of years uh, with a tremendous group of authors from around the world, but also we have um, had a lot of input from member states, from business, from civil society. So uh, up front, I want to thank them for all of their inputs. I'm going to share with you some of the key findings. The assessment will be published in weeks, but effectively what we want to do is to give you some highlights for this debate. Next slide, please. So we have eight findings which we'd like to present today. And the first one, of course, is straight out of the box. We can, can comprehensively say that marine litter and plastics present an existential threat to our vital earth system processes. Now, what does that mean? Well, from the last few years where there's been an exponential increase in um, not only plastic production and waste streams and really all about the reports that we're reading, we can see that there's a trickle down of the impacts right down into the mud, so to speak. So from lazy lugworms who are affected by ingesting plastics all the way through to how we can see our coastal systems actually being reduced in their capacity to uh, look at climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Everywhere we look now, we can see that plastics themselves are having this effect. And what is worrying, and you'll see this, is that if we can barely manage what we have today, how are we going to manage the massive increase we see coming, fueled by lots and lots of investment in different chemical production plants. We do have enough evidence to act. Um, and this is a very clear message from the assessment. There's been an exponential growth in publications, reports, observations, data, and especially models. So there is no inhibition. We don't even have to necessarily incur a sort of uh, statement like the precautionary principle. We know enough to act. And that's at all levels. Thank you, next slide. The third finding then takes us maybe down a little bit more into the detail because we think that we understand what the impacts are and the scale, but effectively we can say some very generic things. So plastics now we see are the largest and most harmful and persistent fraction of marine litter. We know that 80% of it is coming from land-based sources, but our challenge is that a lot of the global figures that we're using on the volumes, on the fluxes, even on the trends and the absolute volumes rely heavily on modeled results. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But the second underpinning and where we desperately need more information is what is the impact at the physical, at the physiological, at the biochemical level on marine organisms and also on human health. Because with that knowledge, we can then begin to really understand how to mitigate. So our concern is that we know the kinds of chemicals leaching from plastics as they degrade, from microplastics as they enter into the body through ingestion and exposure. We understand that that can have an impact, but what we need to do is to test that in environmentally realistic sort of re real world settings um, and really make the link then to all the laboratory studies that have gone on up until now. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, the other side of the coin is the economics. And we can absolutely be clear that these cumulative hazards on the marine ecosystem are there. We have a first estimate from a group, 
that has given us some figures which are very alarming, 500 to 2,500 billion dollars per year in losses to ecosystem functioning. I think the real challenge for us though is that um, the losses from the maritime industries from on land, from damage to infrastructure, flood defenses, all of those services is actually very poorly reported. And so we don't really have a consistent um, picture of what the economics are. And if there was one recommendation that we would make, it is to really bolster and to bring a lot of that quantification out into the open. Next slide, please. Mitigation, the heart of how we can act. So just a little bit of backdrop, we see that we have had 9,200 million metric tons of plastics produced since the 1950s. 7,000 million of that has created waste, plastic waste. So when we think about well, where, where is it all going, we know that of the 75% that's been discarded, much of it has been captured into things like landfills, but it's the onward mismanagement, so to speak, that is really creating our problem. So we think this is probably an underestimate, 60 to 99 million metric tons. It's hard to imagine, but essentially this mismanaged plastics is what is flowing ultimately into the oceans. Now we can see some local successes, national, regional restrictions, bans on different kinds of plastics. They're showing positive trends, but at a very local level. And essentially what we need to try to do is connect all of this towards the political agreements that are in place around the Sustainable Development Goal, those that are supported by the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions. Next slide, please. So really we have two parts to the overall conclusion. We have the need for a proper fundamentally determined risk framework, which is really able to tell us a lot more about where we should be directing our attention. And at the same time, we need to situate that risk framework into a comprehensive global framework that looks at things in a more holistic manner. It's very much like sitting on a bubble, the skin, where you, if you stand on one, the bubble goes up somewhere else. We need to though think of it in a holistic way. We've got decades of research showing us about the occurrence, the fate, the impacts, all in different ways. And we could tackle them one by one. But the issue is, how do we bring those efforts together? How do we educate people so they have a greater understanding of the issues and can really understand what they can do. And ultimately, not only do we want to have a better risk framework to enforce the long-term effectiveness of different actions, but we also need to make sure that we have much greater engagement with business, because it's only going to be through the, the channeling of energy, funds, and finance and investment, together with political push, that we're going to be able to bring this off. But to situate everyone's actions, we really do need this comprehensive global framework. So thank you for that, and very happy to answer any questions as they come up. Back to you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, really interesting to hear that. And you were talking about some of this sort of this huge number of overlapping initiatives which are going on at the moment, which are all sort of all focused on dealing with plastic waste and, and marine waste, um, including many by UNEP and the G20, G7, APEC, European Union, World Bank. ADB, the list sort of goes on and then you move to a government level and then non-government initiatives, including the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum. So there's a whole host of, of actors who are working in this, in this space. And so what I want to do in the next section is to discuss how we can move to this more integrated response and accelerate action by getting all these parties together, really with that ultimate goal of, of meeting the 2025 SDG target on marine litter. Um, and so I want to start with Melissa Wang, who is the senior scientist at Greenpeace. Um, Melissa, um, UNEA provides this sort of unique opportunity to tackle plastic through the science policy business interface, bringing these organizations, these, these parts of the community together. Now, I know there's a lot going on, but I wonder if you could tell us, sort of, you know, in five minutes, give us a highlight of what needs to happen in that space and how these three sectors can work together on this issue. Melissa, welcome. Thank you very much, Charles, and uh, greetings to all panelists and uh, audiences here. And thanks a lot to UNEP and the organizer for the invitation. As a scientific advisory committee member, I have been working with Jacqueline and peer colleagues during the rest of the uh, 
year on the report just introduced by Jacqueline. And the global science community is sending out a very clear message. Waste plastic are found even in the most remote, pristine part of the world. Microplastics are detected in food, drinking water, and the air we breathe, as well as in all major human organs with known health effects. And hazardous plastic additives keep leaking out. Even worse, despite all current efforts, the amounts of plastics flowing into the ocean will double between 2010 and 2025. So evidence is sufficient requesting immediate and accelerated action. Existing measures, including the fragmented global governance landscape, have failed to address these existential threats that knows no boundaries. And this is why, as will be reported, I believe, later by our AHEC Chair Saturo, that numerous countries strongly advocate for a comprehensive global agreement. Not any agreement, but a treaty truly tackles the root causes of this global crisis from a holistic, systemic life cycle perspective and send out strong commitments and clear messages from all countries to all stakeholders. Science is very clear to solve this global crisis. We cannot simply recycle our way out, nor can we just replace conventional plastics with bioplastics. It's far too late to tackle the plastic only when it becomes waste. The solution needs to go deeper and more systemic than that. Rather than buying, bearing or moving the plastic problem in another time or space, the real solution lies back with significantly reducing the amounts of plastics that are produced. Starting with closing the production tap of unnecessary, avoidable and problematic plastics like single use plastic packaging. Through, for example, business model change and a slow and circular economy. To establish a treaty probably is mainly government's responsibility, while in the end, it should be the business sector which benefit from producing, marketing, using, and discarding plastics to shoulder the long overdue ultimate responsibility to act. Greenpeace joined the global break free from plastic movement, working with organizations, citizens, and waste pickers on global auditing of leaked plastic waste by fast moving consumer goods brands, as well as monitoring and reporting the progress of plastic footprint reduction by retailers. Some commitments on plastic reduction have been made through the process, but they are far from enough, for which we believe policy intervention are needed. It has been so long that rewards are privatized while risks are socialized. As Leticia just said, the green recovery for a sustainable post-pandemic world provides an opportunity to reverse it and truly build back better. Unfortunately, instead, some bailout plans or trade deal lobbies only benefit some plastic crisis makers and has the potential to lock the entire world further into a more plastic polluted future, despite efforts made by others. The global treaty under discussion, therefore, should also hold the polluting corporates accountable and address the market failure through, for example, including in implementing extended producer responsibility, internalizing all the externalities and eliminating toxic subsidies along the plastic value chain, while providing enabling environment to incentivize truly sustainable innovation for a just transition. Also, the treaty should respond to the concern of the financial sector, which started to talk about plastic as a potential stranded asset and bring them in this systemic change. It's a great opportunity here to bring together people from different backgrounds like science, policy, and business who tend to look at the world from different lens. But we human beings all have at least one thing in common, and that one I believe is ultimate reason bringing us act together. That's the deep reverence for the secretness of life and nature. 
there was a very rare opportunity for me to join a science expedition to the high Arctic last year to bear witness of the Arctic sea ice minimum, which was the second lowest since record because of global climate urgency. And the whole plastic value chain as put by the report introduced by Jack Lane is driving further global warming while depleting climate resiliency of the earth. It must be reversed. During the 20 days up there, to my surprise, no polar bear, even not a single one was spotted. But instead, let me show you this poor, innocent and entangled sail was spotted. That is a life to be valued. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, very striking image there. Um, I suspect that uh, the sort of your, your call, your mention for a global treaty is something that some of our other um, experts uh, will be will be talking about in some of their own interventions as we as we move through as well. And, and perhaps that is one way of protecting, you know, all of the different actors who are involved in this. And one of those actors, which we don't talk about um, too much, are the Indigenous peoples and their perspective. And so I would like to bring Tina Nagata, if I can, who is environmental and Indigenous rights advocate from Women Major Groups representative. Uh, welcome, Tina. And I'd like to understand from you, Tina, a little bit more about why is social justice and human rights at the centre of your argument in the fight against plastic pollution? Welcome, Tina. Kia ora, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to start off by noting that there's a dominant tendency to see territories as land-based. Even the word territory extends from the Latin prefix terra, meaning land. And this understanding is very widespread in global governance because of how European imaginations have come to dominate how the world perceives itself. However, numerous oceanic scholars have now noted that Indigenous ocean peoples have lived on and with and by and from the ocean for millennia. Our territories are not bound by the ocean the ocean is our territory. And as many of us now know, and as we've already spoken about this evening, uh, plastic pollution has ecosystem-wide impacts in that oceanic territory, from the smallest phytoplankton to the largest sea creatures on the planet. Plastics are responsible for a broad loss of sea life. Over and above the obvious impacts for marine biodiversity, there are further implications for climate change and food webs. Now, if it is the case that the toxins being transferred through these food webs by microplastics have severe health impacts, then this will hold disproportionate impacts for the physical and reproductive health of indigenous ocean peoples who depend upon the ocean as a major food source and get between 75 to 90% of our protein from the ocean. We consume over four times more fish than the global average. And that scenario means that we will not have only been offsetting plastic pollution with public funds, but with indigenous lives. So the impacts for us also extend beyond physical health. We hold our ceremonies on the ocean. The ocean provides our medicine, and in some instances, the ocean is our medicine. For us, the ocean is our home, our educator, our creator, and our ancestor. We are the ocean. And so plastic pollution is not just an environmental, but a human rights issue, particularly for indigenous ocean peoples. And like climate change, it is an extension of our experience of colonialism. So as a human rights and environmental issue, it requires urgent attention. There was some recent analysis carried out by the Environmental Investigation Agency, where 10 Pacific nations were scoped for policy responses to plastic pollution. And the findings included a near complete absence of national waste reduction targets, a, a minimal level of association between plastic pollution and climate change. And when they assessed over 50 environmental policies across 10 nations, only one policy mentioned microplastics at all. Now that report highlights a clear need for a multilateral agreement, but it also highlights a lot of really important thematic considerations that need to be present in any multilateral agreement. 
So from an Indigenous ocean perspective, I'm really happy that a plastics pollution treaty enjoys the support of many UNEA groups like the Women's Major Group. But it would be remiss of me not to point out that it is a common experience of Indigenous peoples that we are left right out of the crafting and negotiation of multilateral agreements that impact upon us first and worst. And that not only fails to meet many of the standards set out within UN conventions and declarations, but it ignores the fact that Indigenous people hold demonstrable expertise in environmental care including the fact that we care for the vast majority of the world's biodiversity in our territories, and that we have sunk over 33 times the annual carbon emissions in our indigenous managed forests. Now, marine biodiversity and ocean carbon sequestration is no different. We know our places. We've successfully collectively managed them for millennia. And so centering us in the crafting of solutions is not just a matter of rights, it's a matter of success. And just a final note on Indigenous science, knowledge and wisdom in this process. The inclusion of Indigenous science, wisdom and knowledge cannot come to the exclusion of Indigenous peoples. Our minds have been extracted from for as long as our territories. And so an effective and rights-based approach here calls upon the UN to include not just Indigenous science, but Indigenous scientists, not just Indigenous knowledge and wisdom, but Indigenous minds. And this can't be viewed as a feature of the multilateral agreement, but it has to be a core social justice requirement of any multilateral agreement that seeks to effectively address plastic pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina, and thank you for your, your intervention. Um, this is a, I'm really glad that you had the opportunity to, to provide that intervention on this, on this, this platform, um, such an important view to take forward. Um, shifting tax slightly, um, I often come at these challenges from a business perspective as we do do with The Economist. And so I want to think about industry here for a moment and turn to Gabrielle Fomi, who is the director of the Plastics Program and Financial Markets Planet Tracker, to understand a bit more about what we can do more in terms of motivating industry. Gabrielle. Well, thank you for the invitation. I hope you can hear me well. And a warm welcome to everybody, whether it's your evening or your afternoon or your morning. Well, Charles, that's a great question. And I don't have um, a cheery outlook, as one can imagine. I mean, most companies and most investors are not taking plastic pollution seriously, period. Plastic is useful for society. We understand that when its production and waste are appropriately managed, but plastic and its production and waste are pollution and climate problems. You know, our distinguished colleagues have explained this already. You know, we know the numbers. 40% of plastic waste ends up in the environment. 11 million tons of plastic waste flows into the ocean. And under business as usual scenarios, plastics industry would account for up to 20% of the remaining global carbon budget we have by 2040 under a 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario. So what's going on? But between the upstream petrochemical names that we may know and the downstream corporate brands that we all mostly know, often know, are the hit is, is the hidden uh, plastics containers and packaging sector. It's the companies that produce the packaging that we then end up disposing of. These companies are hidden. Nobody knows who they are. So in our research, we find 83 publicly, we have eight findings, pardon me. The first one is, it's a very large sector. There are 83 publicly traded companies in the plastic containers and packaging sector and their market capitalization is $126 billion. 20 companies dominate the sector, but nobody knows their names. These 20 companies in the plastics containers and packaging sector that are making the products that a Coke or a Nestle is requesting them to produce, right, account for 64% of the sector's revenue. It's $35 billion. The third finding is, guess what? We looked at over 7,800 fi uh, regulatory filings, and you, we all know the punchline. These are the regulatory filings these companies are re required to report to their regulators where they're publicly traded around the world. And are any of the companies reporting on their plastics policy in the regulatory filings? Are they reporting on plastics pollution? Are they are reporting on ocean waste? I mean, of course, very few. I mean, you're talking 
may at, at best maybe 10, 10 to 15 percent. So companies are not reporting in their regulatory filings the what the risks that their waste is causing and their responsibility for those risks. The fourth find, filing finding, guess what? Very large sector, $126 billion in market cap. Not one green bond, not one in sustainability bond, not one, one sustainability linked note or loan. And 70% of the sector's fixed income is maturing in the next five years. So now is the time for this sector to step up and begin and look at green financing, sustainably linked financing to retool its industry to make the products of tomorrow, not the products of the past. They need to retool towards to focus on recycling, reuse and refillables, not single use plastics. It's a $24 billion opportunity right there in their, in their, in their the upcoming maturing fixed income securities. The next finding, the companies as a whole at a sector level do lack any coherent sector wide strategy. There are companies that are doing good things. There are institutions that are fighting and working out there. There are wonderful foundations. Ellen MacArthur Foundation is fabulous work. Pew Charitable Trust really, really pushing companies. They do not have a, a coherent strategy. One company, I won't name it, sells over 200,000 plastics products. Each is a different SKU or product code. Can I look through that product? To, uh, can I look through their online catalog and sort for which ones are based on post-consumer waste resins? No, 200,000 products, <laughs> zero is your answer. This is not good. Now these next finding, these 83 companies that were over 8,000 institutional investors. These are mutual funds, retirement funds, sovereign wealth funds, banks, insurance companies, where we have, you know, and of those 8,000 institutional investors, only 70 investors, seven zero out of 8,000 own 60% of the sector. Those 70 investors, basically zero, because there is one or two exceptions, have any policy on financing plastic waste or financing plastic retooling towards sustainable plastics future. The final finding, global investors, these same investors have a significant unrealized gains in this industry. Getting to what Melissa was talking about, stranded assets. These investors must act today to prevent the loss of their unrealized gains. These unrealized gains are $24 billion. If they don't act now to protect their investments to prevent these plastics production facilities of becoming stranded assets, whether by regulatory, economic, or physical risks, they, will, they may lose that unrealized gain and that unrealized gain may become an, a loss. So in conclusion, neither companies nor investors have taken plastic pollution seriously. Companies are hiding from their responsibility for the role in the pollution crisis, and investors have billions of dollars at risk of becoming stranded assets when, with their assets and profits possibly becoming liabilities and losses unless they act. Second, neither companies nor investors are actively across the sector focusing on plastic solutions. On the other hand, there are companies or production lines that are doing one plastic solution at a time. That is a sector, the sector has no vision in how it's going to pivot towards the plastics, sustainable plastics production of the future that we need. They have no sector-wide vision on recycling, reuse, and refillables. No. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, some very sobering insights there in your intervention. Um, it does a, a, appear to be that uh, that from an industry perspective, we may still be going down that path of, of greenwashing as an approach for, for industry, um, rather than a more sort of concerted effort um, structured around clear um, clear frameworks and, and actions. Um, I hope to now move into something, uh, some, some more structured examples. Um, of integrated action and innovative solutions. And I'd like to welcome Juan Bofill, who is the senior engineer in the water management 
division for the European Investment Bank. And I'm hoping Juan can tell us a little bit more about the Clean Ocean Initiative and the role that the uh, European Investment Bank has there and um, maybe something a little bit more encouraging than Gabriel has just been talking about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, well, I must say that I'm quite impacted about the powerful interventions that uh, uh, were before me. Uh, they are quite relevant. And uh, the, uh, the European Investment Bank is the EU bank, uh, just to, to, for, for the people who don't, doesn't know exactly what we do with finance. Uh, we finance co uh, co cohesion in the EU, and we also finance European, uh, the European uh, goals and policies, in particular related to environment and sustainability. I will speak about that a little bit later. But going back to the Clean Oceans Initiative, uh, indeed, uh, the, the plastics and marine litter microplastics are high in the EAB's agenda uh, in terms of finding solutions and find uh, funding solutions, both uh, both cases. Um, uh, we all know, it was mentioned before, that the, pro the problem is that 8 million tons uh, are discharged into the oceans, of plastics are discharged into the oceans, but also we know that uh, at least 1.5 million tons uh, of microplastics are also discharged, which turns out uh, uh, to be a real huge, uh, huge problem, environmental and health uh, problems. And we also know uh, that most of these microplastics, for example, are discharged through waterways. Um, and uh, also, uh, plastic microplastics are, are not discharged uh, through micro, uh, this, uh, waterways, but also are caused, caused by uh, mismanaged solid waste. So the EAB, uh, together with other banks, together with KFW and together with uh, um, AFD, the Agence Française de Développement, we uh, created the Clean Oceans Initiative, which is an initiative that we intend to finance 2 billion euro projects, um, in, in financing these projects in, in four years. Uh, and these projects have to be, have to have a, a significant contribution to reduce the discharge of uh, plastic into the oceans. So far, uh, by the end of 2020, we have already reached 65% of this target, of this 2 billion euro. Uh, so one, we are expecting to finalize this and to, to finish the, uh, with this goal by the end of this year, 2021, and then we'll probably extend uh, this goal, uh, this, this goal uh, beyond there. Uh, the examples of projects that we finance are uh, basically targeting solid waste, uh, solid waste improvement, uh, because at the end of the day, this, as I said, plastics are the charges because the, 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 the plastics are not managed properly. The other projects that we're financing are we're trying to, to are targeting our, our stone water management projects because open drainage, open drains at the end of the day end up being uh, liter, uh, liter amounts. And, and, and waste of discharge there, the, 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 the plastics. And also the other projects that we finance are wastewater treatment projects because this kind of uh, the wastewater treatment plants have proved to be very efficient in, order, in terms of reducing uh, and capturing uh, at least nine, uh, can be up to 99% of the, of the microplastics. So uh, the other action that this uh, clean ocean initiative we have done is we have mobilized 6 million euro in technical assistance in order to find, to find and to prepare projects that are being bankable by, by financial institutions like the EIB. Uh, at this, we're targeting to, to, to find 20 and then to prepare up to five uh, until, until levels that we can finance in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, these are quite examples, but uh, uh, if I give you a couple of examples of projects that we are financing that have, are, have, are really relevant for the Clean Oceans Initiative, we are talking of, for example, the stone water management and flood protection in Cotonou, in Benin. Um, and for example, another one would be the wastewater treatment plants in Alexandria in, in, the, in, in the north of, of uh, Egypt. Um, so just this, at the end of the day, as you can see, these are end of the pipe solutions. We cannot deny that because what we, we are doing is trying to capture the, the, the plastics before they reach the, uh, the oceans. We are aware that there should be other, other policies and other, other, other uh, intervention in order to avoid the, the, the source uh, and avoid the, the discharge uh, in the source. But in terms of, uh, for example, in terms of uh, policy, 
we can see that the European Union has some policies. Of course, they are not probably that we should be. We should try to to be more ambitious, but there's still there's there's some policies in order to reduce, for example, microplastics, uh, intentional intentional addition of microplastics, and for example, the reduction of single-use plastics. Huh? That will happen, and uh, and that will happen. And also, uh, there's a new uh, yeah, new uh, trend in order to uh, when the the urban wastewater treatment directive is reviewed. Uh, there will be also include some kind of goals in order to reduce microplastics. Huh? The, the, finally, I would like to say something about the taxonomy. The EU is working on the taxonomy in terms of the, uh, in terms of finding what activities are sustainable, and uh, uh, the climate, the circular economy, and in terms of plastic, uh, will be also very very high in the agenda. Um, that I would like to, to 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 just to say something about optimism about that that we hope that in the near future uh, we can we can try to to uh, to apply policies like banning international uh, like banning the, the addition of microplastics or like uh, 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 banning and avoiding single-use plastics. This can happen, and but we have to push all all, all together. Thank you very much for 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 your time. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for your your intervention. Um, you you talked about this of some of the focus on on solutions for the end of the pipe, which is clearly an important part of this. Uh, Violia is another company who is focusing on this a lot, and I, I've got some pleasure in introducing Patrick Labat, who is the senior executive vice president in charge of the Northern Europe zone for Violia, who is hopefully can tell us about some of the um, the really interesting technologies that they're using to catch and remove plastic and microplastics at source and how this is in some way contributing to the uh, circular economy. Patrick, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning from Paris, everyone. Um, as already mentioned by uh, different people to this morning, I mean, the volume of plastics thrown away in the oceans is roughly about 20,000 tons per day, meaning 17 tons per minute. So it's really urgent to act ashore in order to stop this leakage, as more than 80% of plastic in the oceans come from land-based land -based sources, as mentioned by Jackie this morning. Of course, we can imagine cleaning the ocean, but uh, as it, we, it, we will never be able to collect on a, short run, on a short run such a volume, it's even more urgent to close the tap of plastic before it is sent to, into the oceans. And if I want to make it short, uh, there are two main ways. The first one is stop producing and consuming plastic, but we know that it will take time and create considerable constraints, especially in countries where plastic is the sole alternative to, for example, have an easy access to water, or it will create constraints in healthcare system or for food conservation. But there is also an alternative way uh, to collect the used plastic, to collect the plastic waste before it is thrown away in nature and ultimately to, into the oceans. So the question is, uh, how can we create enough incentive for consumers to collect their plastic waste instead of throwing them away? Environmental awareness, uh, of course, will be useful, but unfortunately, that will not be enough. And the good news, and there is good news, that uh, the solution does already exist, and it's uh, the plastic recycling loop. By recycling the plastic, we create a new raw material, which is used by the industry to recreate new plastic bottles or in, or in any other plastic application. And as this plastic recycling has a value for the plastic industry, it means that the primary material to produce this recycled plastic, meaning the plastic waste, has also value. And as the plastic waste has a value, the industry pays for the plastic waste. And if the industry pays for the plastic waste, it means that the consumers will have an interest, a concrete incentive to give it back into the recycling system instead of throwing it away. That is exactly how a deposit system does work. Just an example in Germany, a plastic bottle is repaid 50 cent of euro when you bring it back to the shop. The result is clear, 95% of plastic bottles are collected. And it's also based on the same type of incentive why Velia is erecting a plastic recycling bottle factory in Indonesia in partnership with Danone. Of course, what we do today within Veolia 
with 400,000 tons of plastic recycling in 2020 is a good start. It shows the way, but it has to be scaled up. And the question is how to increase the volume of plastic recycled with the immediate consequence to increase the volume of plastic waste collected instead of being thrown away in nature. Clearly, first of all, we have already discussed that there are plastic which, are, which will never be collected because they are too complicated and too, and too expensive to collect. And we have discussed about the microplastic, especially used as cosmetic. Even if you are going to invest in wastewater treatment plants, from my point of view, the sole alternative for microplastic is a complete ban. But for the plastic which can be collected, especially by consumers, bottles, flasks, boxes, packaging, and so on, more value we will be able to give to the plastic waste, more they will be, I would like to say, automatically collected because the local community will take immediate benefits from their collection. And in order to give more value to the plastic waste, we have to implement a regulation which will oblige the plastic packaging producer to increase the percentage of recycling material into their product and to create a tax for the usage of virgin plastic and then to use the benefits of this tax to implement or improve the collection system which will help to speed up the process of transition. The technology does exist today with mechanical recycling. And when we know that producing a PET plastic bottle from recycled plastic saved 70% of CO2 emissions compared to a bottle manufactured with virgin plastic, we understand that this plastic recycling is not only good for oceans, but also for climate change. Thank you. Back to you, Charles. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I, I was growing up in Australia. I think of the example you gave about getting some some money back when you take your your clean your glass bottle back to um to to a, to a station, um, and that was a good motivator to to recycle. That doesn't doesn't exist now, apart from possibly in South Australia, in Australia. Um, but yeah, so I can see that as a good motivator. Moving on, um, just want to. I talked a little bit earlier about all of the actors in in actors which are associated within this, uh, this sort of discussion. And I want to bring in Heidi Savelli, who is the Program Management Officer, Global Partnership for Marine Litter at UNEP and the IMO Chair of GPML yeah. into the discussion. And, and Heidi, just to understand from you, um, in terms of the, the lots of the actors and information focused on tackling marine litter, what are the plans that you've got in place at the moment to bring those actors together and aid collaboration? Thank you for that question. Yes, I'm, so I'm with UNEP. Uh, um, we are hosting a global partnership on marine litter. And that the sole purpose of that partnership is to bring together various actors to increase uh, cooperation and coordination, to share ideas, to explore what knowledge and experiences can be used to further in increase impact, but also to, in the extension, look at how to reduce the leakage of plastics into the ocean. That is include encouraging closed loop systems, maximization of resource efficiency, and minimization of waste generation in the first place. So the partnership has been looking at various ways of trying to connect different stakeholders and to try and integrate and support the amount of data and information that is available. Multiple actors are operating in the space. A lot of information is generated, but how can we make that easier for users to really access that and to see in a, in a more integrated way what priority actions are available for their consideration. So this is some things that we have been working on and my colleague Seifel will speak more about it. And as part of this effort, which is running now over two years um, with the Global Partnership Marine Litter Digital Platform, we've also been collaborating with entities like IBM, looking at pilot approaches for various different areas. And we'll hear a bit more about that as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Heidi. You mentioned um, some of these, these things that you're doing. I wanna ask now Seifel uh, Ridwan, who is the Chief Enterprise Solutions for UNEP, um, to talk about the, this, the you have a digital, uh, a lit a digital collaboration platform um, and what you've got going on in the first phase. What have you achieved so far? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Charles. I do have a set of slides to accompany my uh, presentation. Can it be put on? 
so greetings everyone, uh, wherever you're located. So I will be presenting uh, what we call as a GP GPML digital platform. Thank you, next slide. So what is the GPML digital platform? Essentially, it's, a, it's actually a very ambitious uh, they say, uh, project to be able to develop a platform that is open source, one-stop shop, multi-stakeholder platform for curated data, information and knowledge about marine litter and plastics pollution prevention, which has a target of a wide range of targeting, targeting a wide range of stakeholders, as you can see in the list. Now, kindly note the word that curated. So it's not just any data that we publish or information and knowledge, but it's curated or validated through a mechanism of validation that we will also implement ultimately enabling the stakeholders to be able to take actionable uh, decisions, well-informed decisions. Next slide, please. So what are the key features? I'd like to emphasize again on the distributed on open data capture, but at the same time, validated and curated publishing. In addition to having the stakeholders or visitors to the platform access uh, quality, quality data, but also to allow the stakeholders to engage themselves through what we call a smart matchmaking uh, concept of stakeholders. Next slide, please. I hope I will not be able to confuse everyone, but this is just to give an idea of how the system's architecture would look like. So essentially, there are four parts. The left-hand side parts are what we call the series of data, databases or resources or repositories that we're building, intending to build. And actually some of them have actually been built. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, uh, what we call as external data set, which we hope to be able to establish partnerships with data providers around the world to feed in data into the platform so that we can have enriched the platform with, more, with uh, relevant and quality data. And in the center piece is the actual list of functions that we would like to have uh, in the platform and uh, lastly the fourth item is that it will be integrated what we call as the world environment situation group which is a flagship uh, product of the united nations environment program next slide please and in implementing it because it's a very um, i would say in my experience it's quite an ambitious uh, uh, project is that it's a three-year project starting uh, with the first release uh, this month, February, up to 2023. And in between, we have a series of uh, releases uh, each time uh, with more functionality. And at the same time, we will invite through user consultations, a user-centered stakeholder needs and designs process. That way we are encouraging the stakeholders to actually co-design and co-build the platform with us so that it really uh, matches or um, the various kinds of issues and requirements that we face in terms of marine litter and plastics pollution. Next slide, please. So we do require partners. So the partners so far has been grouped into four groups, strategic partners, technology partners, data partners, and knowledge partners. Next slide, please. And this is what we have so far. So most of them, uh, this is, this is uh, the partnership are still ongoing discussion. But as you can see that most of them are coming from the data providers, which is very good and then also strategy partners and to a certain limit uh, technology uh, and knowledge uh, partners. Next slide, please. Uh, just to, to give you a glimpse of what the platform is uh, going to look like. Uh, well, actually it's already been built, uh, but this has not been released today. It will be released on the 25th of February uh, in con considering with, coinciding with the release of the um, Ocean Manual, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is the a glimpse of the homepage where we, whereby we try to use make use of uh, as much as was of possible with visual, visual elements. And in this uh, particular page, you can see a map of the world where it's shaded to, to indicate the intensity of the, the various resources or databases uh, available throughout through in that country. Next slide, please. Uh, so so far we have managed to have the project databases, financing resources, action plans, technical resources, events, policies, technologies, and stakeholders. And you can see, for example, that there's only the indication we have managed to collect 315 projects available in uh, from 155 countries, 26 action plans available in 11 countries, uh, 
two stakeholders in zero countries because uh, they come from international organizations, mainly um, myself and, log and the team is logged in there. But the idea stand is to actually invite uh, everyone, the stakeholders, uh, people who are interested or have uh, concern in this uh, issue to be able to, <coughs> excuse me, to register themselves and connect amongst the stakeholders. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the beta release will be done on the 25th of February, coinciding with the uh, launch of the Global Manual on Measuring SDG 1411, uh, whereby we will have a dedicated walkthrough session of the platform. Yeah, we can't do that today because of very limited time. But on, on the 25th of February, we will have an actual live presentation of the platform. So we do invite you to uh, attend that uh, session. Uh, it's at uh, one o'clock, uh, starting from one o'clock Eastern African time. And please do uh, register. Um, there will be more info information on those uh, URL. And in any case, uh, there is a email, generic email that you can write to if you want to get more information uh, about the platform or suggestion and feedback. And they will, we are also planning to have a user consultation in March. Uh, the date has not been fixed yet, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, if you write to the UNEP, GF, GP, and Marinita, we'll provide more information for that. And then lastly, also to uh, invite everybody to join the Global Partnership on Marine Litter at that address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saifel. Uh, lots achieved in phase one and an impressive roadmap uh, for, for the years ahead. Um, you're relying obviously on, on your partners to develop this. And one of those partners you've, you've both mentioned is, is IBM. And I'd like to move to them now if I can. Um, Nicholas Holmes is the Chief Technology Officer for Global Government. IBM Cloud and Cognitive Software. I'm hoping Nicholas can share from an IBM perspective what the future looks like from, for, for, for you and the work that you're doing with, um, with these people. No, thank you so much, Charles. It's a great pleasure to be here with everyone. I do have a couple of slides. If we could just uh, throw them up, that would be great. But it's absolutely an honor to, um, to follow behind Heidi and Seifel. Um, if we just scroll down just a little bit, please. Thank you. I think, I think that, that as we look through this, right, we've heard so much. You know, I was, I was very honored to, uh, to be able to speak yesterday and just listening to the conversations and the interventions today. Certainly won't go into this slide too, too much. Um, we all understand the, the, the huge extent of the problems that we are all dealing with. Um, it's not just a government perspective, as we've heard, it's an industry perspective. Um, it's, it's a problem that we're all facing and that we all need to be part of the solution, as we've heard from so many interesting and interested constituents. And I think really what, one of my key takeaways from what Cycle was just showing is that with this digital platform, it's a platform of collaboration, it's a platform of engagement. I think that, you know, everyone wants to help, people that want to lean forward, where do they go? And UNEP is doing an amazing, amazing job, you know, in setting up that platform of engagement, setting that platform up as we're moving forward. And I really do believe, you know, my key takeaway, you know, from this slide, right, is that there is an answer. And I do believe that technology can play a part. Obviously, I'm from IBM. You'd be uh, upset with me, Charles, if I wasn't talking about technology being part of the answer, right? Um, but how do we use that technology and how do we use that technology really well? So if you just slide down to the next slide, if you would, please. I think one of my key takeaways yesterday, and I, I don't mean to be too controversial about this one, right, or, or poke people too much. And I saw some amazing, amazing technology, right? As we looked through the maturity of the technology, one of the key takeaways that I took, right, was that we were really looking at sort of like that dashboarding. We had amazing dashboards, right? We had amazing, you know, I saw one presentation, we were looking at how Mexico City was sinking. You know, we had all these amazing images from, from space that we were all netting together and moving together. But if we look at the continuum, right? I mean, that's really step two. So we've got, you know, the optimistic part of me says, look, I mean, that's awesome. It's really difficult to do what we're doing to consolidate the data, to put the data in a meaningful manner to collapse structured data and unstructured data, data from different sources, data from different constituents, that's not easy. But that gets us to step two. When we get onto step five, 
and we're really transforming the organizations and we're really transforming the environment, that's when we're really going to be running at full speed. That's when we're going to be able to do the most amazing things together, right? So the good news to me on this one is that we've got an amazing amount of runway still to go. We've got amazing technology that we can enable. So if you go to the next slide, you know, part of the answer that we have from a technology standpoint is obviously around data and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence for us is augmented intelligence. How do we enable the likes of Cypher or Heidi or Patrick or Charles to be the best that they can be, right? How can we put information at your fingertips to make those decisions? Well, one of the ways we're doing that, right, is eliminating data silos. What if we could connect to data much, much, much more quickly? Then we're not spending so much time and so much effort. There's only so many minutes in the day that we can use, right? How about if I was using those to really think more about sort of analyzing and infusing those decisions into our policies, into our, our business, into our way ahead versus spending the bulk of our time collecting and organizing it. That's easier to do now. Technology is there. It's ready to rock and roll, right? And then we want to operationalize AI, right? With trust and transparency. What does that really mean? And how do you get started? If you go down to the next slide, we use a very simple paradigm, right? If you heard me back in June, you know, we, we were, were talking about this. It's think big, start small, scale fast. And of course, you know, a little bit in parentheses afterwards, it's fail fast, right? Um, what we're talking about here is, you know, being ambitious, but getting started and getting started quickly. You saw Cycles timeline, right? It's going to be a long, it's going to be a complicated pro project that he's working on. But what can we do in the meantime? And a couple of examples, if, if you guys were, were involved yesterday, you saw my good friend, my digital human friend, Sam, and Sam's new friend, Bella, that he found on the internet dating website that he was like hanging out in, right? So we've got digital humans. They're powered by artificial intelligence, but they're a way to engage. They're a way to bring the broader community in. And when we say start small, what we're thinking is, what can we do in the meantime, right? As we've got these big complicated projects that are unfolding, they've got their own timeline, and that makes a lot of sense. What can we do in the meantime to energize the community, to bring people together? And quite honestly, we started with the dashboarding too. You know, one of the things I was going to show yesterday was the fabulous dashboard that we created, um, linking whole bunches of data together, being able to link all that together within four weeks, being able to create a dynamic dashboard that was showing litter density and debris types down at the hyperlocal level. I mean, that's great, but that's just that descriptive analytics. When we get into those other types of analytics, the proactive analytics, the predictive analytics, the tools that we can be doing, that's where we think we can make a huge amount of success and we can scale that very fast. Now, what does that mean and what does that take? That takes the community coming together. If the likes of IBM bring the technology, we've got all those data providers that Cycle showed us that have already signed up. And all those people that were talking earlier today about how they want to be involved and want to be involved, if we bring everyone together, that's how we're going to be able to scale very fast. And if occasionally we fail, it's not the end of the world, right? It doesn't have to be 100% correct. You saw Sam, sometimes he gets a bit confused about what he's talking about. So anyway, net, 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 I think that we are in a really good place. I think UNEP, with the likes of Heidi and Cycle, we're in very, very safe hands, in very secure hands. They're moving forward with speed. I think that we can do these collaboration projects. We're about to run a collaboration event, which we're looking for participants. We can use this technology, use this data together to really start chipping away at the problems and start creating meaningful impact. So Excellent. I'm optimistic, Charles. Excellent. Thank you. Good optimistic note there. Thank you for, uh, for sharing those examples. I'm going to move on quickly um, to our next uh, intervention, which is Audrey Hassan, who is the head of GEO for Blue Planet European office at Mercator Ocean International. And Audrey sort of like Nick um, has to deal with a challenge, which is quite a good challenge to have, which is how to deal with too much data um, and how to understand that and use that and leverage that in a, in a, in a, in a good way. So Audrey, I'd like to understand from you, what are, is, is data, is that the major challenge that you're facing? Um, can you give us a bit more of an understanding around that and how it relates to marine litter? Of course, uh, I have a few slides if uh, the back office could uh, could share them. But uh, first of all, thank you and merci for the uh, introduction and the invitation here. Um, this is actually my last slide. Yes, thank you. 
so as Char was saying, um, I'm the head of the new European office of GeoBlue Planet. GeoBlue Planet is a little bit smaller than IBM. <laughs> Uh, it's the ocean and coastal arm of GEO, the group for Earth observations. And uh, the idea is uh, that the group uh, of um, Earth observation is an intergovernmental uh, partnership that gathers 100 uh, government and other 100 uh, institutions to um, foster uh, the use of Earth observation for informed um, decisions. And um, so I'm going to be talking today about, I'm going to give a brief overview as a physical oceanographer on the importance and challenges of um, monitoring marine litter as a support for JP, um, GPML that was just presented by ID. Um, we conducted a study on uh, the challenges behind monitoring and marine litter. So first of all, um, what we call uh, ocean plastic here is basically anything that is made uh, from man-made uh, polymers. And we have, we're dealing with an infinite uh, range of sizes. We have giant ghost nets that are made of polymers. And then we go down to macroplastics, such as bottles, uh, but also the fragments of any plastic uh, thing that will create uh, microplastic. And we go all the way down to uh, nanoplastic, and I couldn't show you a picture, I'm just showing a glass of water because that's exactly what it is, we cannot actually see it. And on top of this, if we can change to the next slide. Please, thank you. Uh, we also have, uh, we're dealing with uh, a very large number of uh, monitoring technologies ranging from the research institution using satellites or uh, very uh, technical analytical tools, but also the citizen science uh, scientists who uh, bring on the table a, an infinite or like a really uh, great number of data, of observational data sets. And this is where the challenge is. We have, we, um, we have a lot of data that needs to be comparable and we have people giving us uh, the size or the weight or the type of polymers, but all these data sets need to be uh, comparable and, and uh, interoperable. If you move to the next slide. Yes, and uh, monitoring uh, marine litter today is a uh, really important. Um, uh, we're gonna use um, the observation that I just described, but we need to uh, integrate them with uh, a, um, higher, I would say, technologies such as uh, just been presented. Uh, if we use uh, modeling, like ocean modeling, but also artificial intelligence to try to extract as much as we can from all these amazing data sets that we have, we're going to be able to um, study the impact of pollution, which is really important because you're going to have, uh, as uh, was shown before, entanglement or uh, and a direct uh, impact on the food chain that will uh, end up in, on our plates, but also uh, great impacts um, on the economy uh, because of uh, the changes in the, the, tourist, um, the tourist business. We also want uh, through this uh, monitoring of marine litter to guide informed policies because uh, banning straws or uh, banning uh, microplastics from cosmetics is really different and will have different impacts. And that's also where monitoring marine litter can help because we can evaluate the effect effectiveness of both politic, uh, policies, but also actions. And this monitoring um, can also direct in situ action. As was said earlier today, we can start by cleaning the middle of the ocean, but maybe it's a little bit uh, smarter to uh, start cleaning the ocean where uh, the, the marine litter is actually entering the ocean, such as estuaries or um, beaches and uh, other places like this. So yes, I think uh, monitoring uh, marine litter today is um, presenting a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities where we can actually integrate the observation and other technologies to create, um, for example, um, digital uh, or digital twin oceans and, and so on. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you Audrey. Uh, really interesting. Thank you for sharing your, your intervention. I'm uh, going to move on to, we're, we're almost at the end of our session today, so I need to motor through quite 
quite quickly. But to end the session, I'd I'd like to focus on the uh, sort of actions of, of of one country, and I'd like to, really happy to um, introduce His Excellency Satoru Lino, who is the chair and deputy director. Office of the Marine Environment, Environmental Management Bureau, Ministry of the Environment for Japan. And uh, Satoru, really interested to hear from you about your ambitious policies that you have underway in terms of multi stakeholder engagement and the process governments have undertaken. Satoru, please welcome to the discussion. Excellent. Thank Hi, you. Is, yeah, this is Satorino speaking from from Japan, uh, Tokyo. Um, happy to see you all. Uh, this is Satorino from Minister of the Environment. Uh, uh, today, I, I just want to uh, uh, introduce quickly uh, what we have uh, discussed and achieved under AHEG, uh, Ad Hoc Open Ended Export Group, and uh, UNIA on uh, marine bitter and microplastics. Uh, so uh, could you please uh, show the presentation file I submitted? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, as the, uh, the topics for today is on uh, scientific knowledge and also a multi stakeholder platform. Uh, I'm gonna uh, focus on these two uh, while talking about the achievement of AHEG. The, the next slide please. So as most of you may know very well, uh, the AHEG was uh, triggered by construction by UNIA 3 almost uh, three years ago. <clears throat> and uh, and the mandate was to stock take, uh, take stock, uh, please hold on a minute, second please. Uh, thank you, Satoru. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, if I could just. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sorry, no, Satoru, no, if no. I could just uh, give you a reminder, you've got three minutes left on your. Uh, we're we're quite short of time here, so. Uh, but but thank you for your intervention. Sure, of course, of course. So, uh, uh, so please let me get back. And uh, so uh, last November uh, we formulated a chair summary, and uh, we submitted it to UNIA. Uh, it's all online and uh, and uh, as for please next uh, please so as for a scientific scientific basis we proposed to further expand uh accumulate and share scientific knowledge and particularly uh, notably it is very important to um, emphasize that uh, the scientific knowledge or scientific uh, knowledge sharing is not for curiosity, but for policy approach. So this is uh, to facilitate the necessary evidence-based and the science-based policy approach. Uh, so um, again, this is not for curiosity. And the next slide, please. So as for multi-stakeholder engagement, uh, we proposed uh, next slide, please. So we propose to facilitate multi-stakeholder engagement, and we listed up examples like SICOM or partnership under Basel Convention. So, uh, and uh, based on this uh, achievement, Japan uh, is now committed to, how to say, further accelerate uh, the facilitation of multi-stakeholder engagement. And next slide, please. So we now, um, not as a chair country uh, of AHEG, but uh, as one of the most committed countries in the world on this issue, we are now planning to uh, to build new, uh, not necessarily new, a multi-stakeholder platform with close uh, partnership with UNEP. 
So this is to facilitate uh, the usage of multi-stakeholder platform and, and expand its scope. And we are now planning to have a uh, both uh, online and offline platform. And uh, we always uh, welcome a diverse range of participants, including member states, of course, UNEP, private sector, industrial sectors, and experts, and international organizations, NGOs, etc. So, uh, and uh, uh, we want to always, we always want to be very constructive, and uh, we try, we will try the best to, to produce as much as as fruitful outcomes as possible. Uh, sorry for my for the noise in the background, but thank you very much for no problem. Uh, no problem. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your your intervention and thank you for the for the brevity. Um, very interesting. Uh, just before we finish, I want to draw on two major stakeholder groups um, for a, for a brief intervention. Um, and if I can ask both of you, please, just to stick to a to a one minute intervention, if possible. Uh, the first is Ahmed Fati. If I could ask you to uh, to speak first. Good afternoon from Cairo. I hope everyone can listen to me well. Here, I'd like to ask one question. How we can change the mentality of the private sector? In the last few years, we were working with uh, companies for uh, company social responsibility about uh, marine litter, and they support us to collect uh, garbage from many places. But after COVID, all the companies say they are losing money, they are losing money. So how we can bring this private sector back to support our initiatives for uh, ban single-use plastic and for marine litter. That's first. Second, for my country in Egypt, uh, last October, we, we built a new law of trash. We will ban it. It had one part of single-use plastic. It was work from our NGO and other NGOs. So I, I encourage all NGOs around the world to talk with the government to make a political agreement for marine litter. And finally, I ask uh, Yoneb and Azur, we need an education program, not for specialists. It is for the people they are working at hotels and working for many places close to the sea or ocean or lake or something for marine litter. We have to educate them from the garbage man to the director because they don't know the problem. They don't know the trash and the marine litter will end the life like on Red Sea. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your intervention. Um, Gabrielle <laughs> would certainly agree with your first point and how to what we need to do in terms of um, um, changing their mentality of the, of the private sector and motivating them towards this issue. Thank you for your, your intervention. Um, and if I could ask um, uh, Radup Singh, please. Um, and if I, if you can keep it to, uh, to sort of a, a minute for your intervention, that would be appreciated. Thank you so much. So uh, as the distinguished speakers have already mentioned, the concerns on mismanaged uh, plastic waste, uh, drainage and sewage systems permeating these plastics into air, land, water, and posing pollution and health security risks as well. Unfortunately, uh, the single use plastics are destined to become waste by design. So there is an intervention gap at the source itself. At uh, UNEP MGCY, we reiterate, reiterate for an urgent coordinated and integrated actions through partnerships, multiple stakeholder engagements and intergovernmental engagement, uh, focusing on better monitoring of marine littering, reporting of the waste generation at the source, gradual shift to alternatives, routine assessments, as well as joint evaluation mechanisms through integrating geospatial and analytical tools to translate information into actions and promote validated and informed policy decisions to monitor and uh, measuring the progress and effectiveness in tackling uh, the plastic pollution. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Radulp, and thank you for calling out the, 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 the increasing issue of, uh, of single-use plastic there as well. So, and lastly, I'd like to call on... Um, uh, Excuse me, uh, but I'd like to call on Adu Minsa Jr., if I may, for a, for a final intervention. Oh, sorry, looks like we may have uh, we may have lost Adu. Um, that brings us towards the end of our session here today. I'd like to thank you everybody for their for their contributions. Just in terms of wrap up, a few few thoughts I've been taking down as we've been discussing and taking some notes here, and to see that. 
While it is encouraging to see that a myriad of initiatives to address plastic pollution do exist, better coordination, I think we can all agree, is needed to be more effective because current efforts are just not enough to stem the tide of plastics. With the Global Treaty possibly the solution to meeting the SDG target on marine litter? A few of few people have called out that, that Global Treaty is in, in their interventions. Monitoring and evaluation of progress among these initiatives are rare. Um, and a risk framework uh, might be the way to, uh, way to assess where to prioritize interventions. And that may make a big difference in sort of focusing our efforts. Unlike the e-waste challenge, which I was talking about um, yesterday on the forum, a lack of information is sort of, is not uh, such a problem um, when we're talking about um, uh, marine waste. Rather too much information sometimes does make it difficult for policymakers to engage and understand what they need to do. Um, this leads to programs and policies often being piecemeal uh, with most countries lacking a comprehensive national plan to reduce plastic pollution. But initiatives such as the Global Partnership on Marine Litter and its digital platform can really help to focus um, efforts by guiding prioritization of action, building on resources available and coordinating key industry collaborations while in drawing on some of those advanced technologies, which um, we heard in the, uh, the IBM um, intervention earlier on. This is really a, um, a critical time for all of us in this debate. Um, and it's critical that it's happening now and all these interventions are so important now because in the years, in a year's time, um, the eyes of the world will be on UNEA um, and our governments will be hoping for decisive actions to come out of that, that meeting in, a, in about a year's time. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Apologies that you weren't able to have more time, um, but I, what you were able to provide to us was really interesting and, and engaging, not just for me and I hope for the uh, for the wider audience that have joined us on um, across YouTube and, and the other platforms people are viewing this on. So thank you very much for your time, really appreciate it. Um, our next session, which is in uh, slightly over 30 minutes time, which gives us enough time to go away and grab a coffee or a tea, or, a, or a, in my case, it's evening here. So a quick dinner before I come back in 30 minutes for a great uh, session on rethinking cities. Uh, by bringing nature to the urban environment. This is a topic which I'm, I'm particularly excited about. I really like thinking about what we could do. Um, for example, if we start automating transportation more and freeing up all of that transport infrastructure in a city for other purposes and bringing more space to bring that urban environment into the city. So I'm looking forward to that one in, in 30 minutes time. I hope you can all enjoy uh, join then as well. So. That's it for us. Thank you very much for your time. Again, thank you to our panelists and the organizers.